So um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And you know, thank you for all the support from the teachers also in the back. I'll be presenting. My name is Tanika Anwaruri Yatwong. I'm a lecturer at KBTT and also helping out with um, doing some research in the classrooms here at the school. So, um, yeah, so the title of the talk again was announced. Um, my focus or what I'm interested in is really quantifying um, certain aspects that I, I think um, I'm interested in, for example, you know, interpersonal relationships. Okay. So this particular classroom um, combines Waldorf, you probably have heard um, over the panel talk um, the other day, that Waldorf, a part of the Waldorf activity was incorporated into a constructionist classroom. And so today I'll be presenting a bit more uh, because uh, I, I, I assume that most of you are teachers or educators. So yeah, so this classroom, um, it's hard to see, but the children were actually making mind maps. So in this particular way that the teacher set up a constructionist classroom, they get to do projects of their own choice. Um, and you know, they get to bring some, even at this very young age, and you know, again, the object to think with um, in the constructionist um, setting uh, was also presented here. So the children actually here were building robots' house, uh, were building robots out of these boxes. So, um, and the teacher then combines the constructionism also together with some board of activity. And, um, but particularly for this one, it, some of you might have not seen it, it's called Red Home, which is a you know, floating decoration. It's part of the Thai culture to do this um, in, on a yearly basis. So it's made out of banana, parts of the banana, and flowers and all these decorations as a way to actually um, giving thanks back to you know, the, the water, the water spirits. Part of the school motto is also you know, the MQ, which was um, really preserving the culture and you know, finding, understanding the roots and everything. So while the children were actually uh, working on these um, objects sitting with other artifacts, um, they get to actually reflect on you know, where the bananas come from, you know, how to get, how to actually make these things. You know, some people would go and buy them because now it's probably easier to buy them. And they're made out of artificial, you know, like they're made out of styrofoam or you know, like plastic, and once you float into the river, then eventually it becomes like, you know, pollute the, the, the river. So the other aspect of this classroom was the combination of Bordor in combining, so, you know, smoothly together with constructionist um, setting. So the teacher here, um, I don't know if she's here or not, but I don't see her. But in this classroom, um, she she actually um, thought that once upon reading, encountering the work from Rudolf Steiner, she thought that this would actually help the students to be able to focus and help better that process of doing constructionism. So some, some of the students were a bit lacking on the side of self-control and ability to focus. So she thought that like, by doing these activities, um, which I'll show a bit later. Okay, so this example is uh, the children were actually picking up the very small beads using the chopstick. And this is part of the circle time activity where they get to, you know, focus and listen to one another and working on activities together. But like in Waldorf activity, um, you know, you tend to see them sitting one, next to one another a lot. And this was the other activity that they learned how to actually um, weave out of papers. So again, you know, they always work in pairs or in groups, but eventually they'll come and sit down in a circle. And then later on, we'll have like a sharing session where they get to listen to other people's work and also reflect on what they learn as well. This is also another setting where the children were learning how to bake. 
So we, you probably saw on the fifth floor, that's actually a kitchen, and all the utensils are kind of lower than the normal size. Again, understanding, um, really forming the knowledge wasn't just, you know, receiving, which is actually what I'm doing right now, um, but it's really learning and sharing from each other. So students get to do this a lot on a, you know, um, on a daily basis. And having, you know, good friends where they can actually kind of create the learning environment that is conducive for learning is really crucial. So my interest is really focusing on why is it, you know, that we need to look at personal, interpersonal relationships in classrooms. Um, there's been research that has shown, has shown that um, the interpersonal relationship actually provides the students a sense of belongingness. And it became a strong motivator in their interest in school. And also, you know, positive relationship with their peers are also related to academic performances as well as, you know, po positive perception of their own self. So the typical way that people used to assess, you know, this kind of engagement in, in the team um, could be, you know, questionnaires or observations. But I think what, of course I'm not discrediting that method, but I'm just saying that there's some, you know, downside to that thing and say open-ended interviews. If interviewing you know, a very young child and really kind of getting information. Sometimes you're actually intervening in the process of getting that information by interjecting what you're expecting, even though it could be open-ended. Or sometimes, you know, verbal, verbal communication might not have been the best possible way to extract the information from the, from the children. The other one, observation, you know, again, requires full attention from the facilitators which, you know, in Thailand on average, it's one teacher for 20 students. So, imagine how you would do that, um, you know, apart from, you know, conducting the class and also observing each one of them, you know, 20 of them in a class, like, all the time. So I find that, you know, something's kind of difficult. So I wanted to come up with a way to make this task easier for teachers. So what I did is, you know, it's very important to look at, to extract most information out of a small set of data, which I'll show later in, in this way how I was able to extract, you know, using probability to look, to in, in, help it, um, in terms of, yeah, I'll talk about it. And, but assessing the primary aspect of interpersonal relationships. Again, you know, this is not the, kind of comprehensive way of assessing it, but just a few of the aspects that can actually be easily taken out of a day of daily classrooms. And I want the method to be independent of the demographic of the students. Let's say they're in a classroom where I want to compare the student to an average student, not just a student particularly in this classroom. So I'll show you some of the data. So we uh, conducted a study in um, classroom um, where the average age is about 8.4 years old and there are about 8 students in the classroom. The teachers collect the data which is, you know, the number of peers around the student of interest. So there was one student, I wouldn't say any, but, you know, he, the, the facilitator said that um, she's very concerned about, you know, his or her interpersonal relationship with others. Um, so I wanted to really see if that's actually what the data would show. So I asked her to collect the, to count the number of peers surrounding the student in a particular activity, and also the time that this student spent with others. So only these two numbers um, for each of the activity in the seven days that she spent from 9 to 4 p.m with the students. Um, you know, of course there are wide-ranging activities like there's fab lab, there's, you know, like physical education, there's scouts, there's like English, math, and Thai, which are actually construction in classrooms. Um, there's, you know, breaks, um, project, experiment, creative time, circle time, which are world of work activities. So you see some combinations of these. These are world of work inspired activities. 
these are um, constructionist activities. The two things I want to assess, again, is the relative popularity index. And the other one is how much this person is paying attention to other, or the period of social engagement. So let's say, oh, I made some drawings, so I hope that helps. So this is the student we're interested in, in the star, the red star there, and among all the eight students. And you know, you count the number, the data that I get from the teacher is the number of the students surrounding the star. So in this case, for example, you know, this number is three. And, but you don't know what happened with others that in terms of grouping. So this is a definite, right? But this is what you don't know, and you want to make an estimate of that. So there are many ways that they can form group, like groups of one, groups of one, you know, one group of four, like twos and two, two and one. You know, there are many different combinations. So I assume equal probability of happening. And then you wanted to compare the student who's an average student in this classroom where this uh, blue circle would fall in. And again, you know, you generate all the possible grouping in C. And then you put them, this is what we know for sure. So we fix that, right? Because we got that data already. And then we just wanted to alternate where this blue dot would go. So just generate all the possibility and then compute the expected number of peers surrounding the student in the blue dot. And then we compare that to the number, the expected number, yeah? Remember what the blue dot is over there? It's an average student, so we don't take this information. The only information we take is number three. And we want to interpret, we want to interpolate what the expected number surrounding any student in the classroom is in order to compare the two numbers. I see a lot of confusing things. <laughs> um, so the goal here was to compare the relative popularity. So let's say the student X who we think was lacking in interpersonal relationships and the other student which we don't know who, just an average person. But the thing is we cannot um, count all the number of surrounding peer for each student in all the classes. Because then you would have to take eight numbers. And you have to, you know, do this like for, from nine to four. I wanted to, you know, interpolate what that surrounding number, the number of surrounding students, surrounding any student that's not X would be. Okay, so the rel relative popularity was defined um, I defined it as the difference in the expected numbers of being X and non-X. So in the previous example would be would be three minus the other number that we computed. Yeah. And then we computed these for all the activity types. So you know in Fab Lab, in English math class, in during break, and Waldorf activity class. Um, this one, the other primary aspect of interpersonal relationship I wanted to quantify is the period of social interaction. Again, I asked the teacher to count two things. One is the number of peers surrounding student X. And the other one is the total time this X spent with the surrounding peers. Okay, so again, you know, just finding the relative um, expected total time. So the, I only explain how to compute the expected number of surrounding peers, but in the same way you would compute that for the expected time. So I'll show you some data. Um, so here on the x-axis we have uh, different classes, you know, from fab lab to um, like breaks, lunch breaks, snack breaks, and play time. Um, and what you're looking at on the y-axis is the relative increase in popularity. For example, if it's positive, that means X has more interpersonal relationship than an average student. 
So if it's negative, then p has less uh, expected number of peers surrounding him compared to any student in the classroom. So, and the other one is attention, which is the expected time. So again, you see very similar trends here. I'll go back and forth a bit. On the x-axis, is the same. Okay, so what we found was that you actually have like, if you look at the in all for all the classes, right? The student did not have different interpersonal relationship aspects compared to any friend in the classroom. But there's there's actually variation across activity. There's no not enough significant variation across population, which was actually the original observation of the teacher. But you know, there's actually variation across, you know, learning environments. For example, in, in Fab Lab, you know, there could be various causes for this. I'm not saying that, you know, like this is bad and this is good. You know, for example, in Fab Lab, maybe the activities are actually individual based compared to group activity in the Waldorf kind of setting. Again, I said that variations of interpersonal relationships are the, the two primary Um, it's not significant across individuals. The differences are sig not significant across individuals, but it's significant across learning environments. And particularly, it's very, it's much reduced um, when the student is in that lab. And also English and Thai classes, and math also. Okay. So, <coughs> of course, like this, this way of um, coming up with this very simple number did not really you know, help us figure out the factors that really causes that variation. It just shows that there, there are variations across learning environments for this one student. So other factors could be the learning environment is different, you know, the setting of the room, um, or you know, it could be the nature of, of activities, which I said that you know, in that lab could be you know, an individual-based activity compared to Waldorf, where it's actually like a group-based activity. And the other one is uh, maybe students have different preference. They, this student X might not get along with student Y, and then student Y is very popular. So in a sense that he would not want it to be a part of this group. That was not taken into account in our calculation. You can, you know, conjecture, you know, have like other conjectures for, you know, what could cause these variations. So our future work was really focusing on maybe gathering uh, more detailed observation using the, you know, like video recording to help normalize for the effect of nature of activity. Again, you know, as I was explaining that in you know, maybe the students were expected to, yes, uh, okay. maybe the students were expected to be alone, you know, in this particular activity, and that was actually what helped that person engage in their own thinking. So, you know, in that way, it doesn't mean that this person is lacking in their social engagement with other friends. Okay. And also systematically test the effect of different learning environments on interpersonal relationships. In this way, it can help facilitator understand what actually best fit this particular student. It might not be that he, you know, he doesn't get along with all friends. It's just that the learning environment has to change in order to bring out the social engagement within him. And we saw that there's actually variations across all the learning environment. And you know, I didn't really explain in too much detail on the detail of the learning environment. But on the ones that he has more interpersonal relationship with others, so it's actually an open space. It's not in, you know, like there are no closed doors. It's probably like an open space where he can run around. And that's when he actually, he's actually better on social engagement than other friends. Okay, so I'm kind of running out of time.
So again, you know, limitations um, of my method. And the conclusion that we came, we came up with two measures for our interpersonal relationship, which is the surface popularity, uh, the relative popularity of the student, and the attention um, that the that student has on, you know, their friends. Of course, this method is, you know, you only need to count the number, like only one number, and then you can interpolate for n number of samples. And yeah, again, you know, in the observation of the teacher, she didn't feel that the student, she felt that the student had a problem in terms of being friends with others. But our data really proven otherwise, that he has the potential to be good friends with others. It's just that the learning environment has to be conducive of that. So, um, I'll take any questions. Thank you. I was in the back, I don't know if you're here. So, um, so, my question to you is, I know that there's like a really big goal to this, right? So what would you want um, to see in like a school, or a classroom, or maybe a policy You know, the eventual, eventually what the, the research could lead into creating what I envision in a classroom. And he asked about that vision. So, I want to, well, this is like really a dream, so I'll share with you. Um, I want to create a space where everyone can feel that they can truly be themselves without, uh, you know, so the environment, I want it to be able to change according to the preference of each person. So of course, but first we need to be able to, I'm a quantitative person. So some of you uh, might be against that method, but I think that there's so much that we can do with um, data analysis that can actually help uh, kind of overcome the cognitive biases that we all do have, you know, as a team. So that you know, I want a space where everyone can go in and it knows you and you know that and and, and you can learn anything in that space. The significant differences between individual children. That seems surprising to me that there were no differences. Were you surprised? Yeah, I was surprised too because I was expecting <laughs> Yeah. So I wanna quantify how how far off he is from other friends so then you know your question. So, so why was that? Had they got it wrong that he wasn't, if he was interacting as well as the others? So these are only, you know, like sort of <coughs> popularity index. Um, the quality of relationship, that's another thing. Maybe she was uh, combining that together with other things. Or maybe, you know, her attention was mostly in certain class that he didn't really get along, you know, just being around friends. We actually thought of this together. We kind of talked and came up with the method together. Asking, I asked her how she would define students who's lacking in relationship with others. And she said, you know, he's always alone, or she's always alone. So that's why you know we came up with this count of like numbers of people surrounding this student. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, I've done some research on how uh, students' interests change during the course of the uh, construction activities uh, in uh, international collaboration project. And I found that uh, uh, their interests start with uh, taking things. But uh, when they finish making something, <coughs> Uh, they start to make uh, use of this repartments. So they, they are interested in shift from making things to uh, making relations with others. Uh, I remember if you put uh, some uh, changes of the uh, personal application to the course of learning. Yeah, to love the back. So he asked, you know, if 
doing construction in the or in a constructionist classroom, there are periods where students could be engaged on a task and then later on their interest shifts from an object to actually relationships with others. And he asked if my work actually took that into account and it didn't, except that you know the second graph that I show was normalized by the time. So it's actually an average um, based on the length of time that was observed. So I didn't say that it was the entire period and put the same weight on that. But you know, again, limitation that I wanted to address was actually normalizing for the nature of activities that could be, you know, one more conducive of, you know, engagement with others and the other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 